the first thing we need to do is define what a search algorithm is. And a search algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure that searches and looks through some kind of data structure, whether that be some kind of graph, maybe a maze, maybe some kind of tree structure. And you're searching through the structure for some kind of desired data. Depth first search is one way to search through these data structures. And it does this by picking a starting point and then choosing down a path and going deep down the pathway to try to find the solution or try to find your desired um, information. And if you hit a dead end, you then backtrack until you have new branches that you can explore. So you explore deep down the path first and then explore branching paths later. So I've got two examples here. One is going to be with a graph and the other is going to be with a maze. So in the first example, we're going to decide to start at node A. Node A is the starting position of this graph in this case. So we're going to start at node A and we want to go to node Z because node Z is going to hold the information that we want. Doing depth first search or any searching algorithm for that matter is you need to give some kind of rule to what path the search initially takes. So for this case using letters I will have it go down the path that has the lowest letter or um, alphabetical order. So starting with A we're going to look at both nodes it's next to and it's next to a C and an E. C being the first one in alphabetical order so we'll go to the C. The next places for the algorithm to look for or the adjacent nodes is D, E, and R. Well D is the next node available so we would go to that node. Then our nodes is S and Z. If you decide to make the algorithm a little bit smarter you can have it realize that Z is an adjacent node and that's our goal node and just send it straight to Z. If your algorithm is a little more naive and is just following the strict rules it would then go ahead and go to S first and then from S there's only one option it would then go explore R. Now from R it's at a dead end because it's already explored C so there's no point for it going back to C. So it's going to then backtrack to S and there are no unexplored nodes for it to go at. So we'll then backtrack again to D and look at the adjacent nodes. The next node is Z. It'll then go to Z and you've reached your goal. Now let's say we wanted to um, instead of going to Z we wanted to go to L. For this case, we would still have to go through this same route because we're doing an alphabetical order, but now when we search C, or now when we search the node Z, we're now at another dead end. So we'll have to again backtrack and go back up to C. And then from C, the next node that's not been visited is E. From E, it searches H. From H, we have K and L. K is the next in alphabetical order, so it goes to K. And then with only one option, goes to Q. It's a dead end, has to backtrack to K, has to then backtrack again to H, and then it has one more option, which is L. So it goes to L, and we've then found our new desired goal. Now let's go to a real-life example, and that's a maze. Whether you know it or not, depth first search is most likely the way that you're going to find the exit and get through a maze. Most people, when they go through mazes, either follow the left turn rule or the right turn rule. And what that simply is, is that you go along the left wall all the way through until you hit the end. Or you go through the right, or you follow the wall on your right side all the way through until you hit the end of a maze. So we'll do just that. For 
this case, we're going to make it the right wall rule. So we're going to keep the wall to the right as we progress through here. And we're always going to take the right turn. So starting at the start, we come here, hit a, hit a junction. We're going to follow to the right. All follow the right wall. Comes this way. We go up here. We then hit a dead end. We now have to backtrack. So we then backtrack. And now we have a new way to go. So now it's to our right. And we'll go to the right, following this wall on our right side. Down here, hit another uh, dead end, have to backtrack again. We have a new unexplored way to the right. We then follow this to the right, along this way, have to backtrack, follow along here, have to backtrack again. And now we have to backtrack all the way back to the start. So that was the wrong way. But now, the right turn is this way, since we backtracked. And now we explore this new path that we haven't explored yet. Always making sure to follow the right wall. Again, when we hit a dead end, we backtrack. And eventually, by following this right wall, even in a real life situation, you would eventually find your way out of any kind of maze. Whether it's a hedge maze, corn maze, whatever. It might take a long time, but you're guaranteed to find the solution at some point. This is a real life example of the depth first search in action, whether you realize you're employing it or not. So the naive approach to the depth first search algorithm that I just showed you will find you your desired information, what you're looking for, but it won't necessarily find it the fastest or most efficient way. You can actually use depth first search to find the shortest path or distance or whatever to get to your desired location or your desired information if you modify it a little bit. Because normally with the naive approach, you could have a depth first search that goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 and to 6. In this path, when we put weights to the graph, uses would add up to 1 plus 6, which is 7, plus 2, which is 8, 9, plus 1 is 10, plus 4 is 14. So the path distance that it took is 14. However, that's not the fastest way possible. It's just a way possible. In order for this modified version of depth first search to work on shortest path, you have to have some kind of weight, whether that be distance it takes, whether that is time it takes, whether that's how many steps it takes, Instead of going from node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, maybe it's just node 1, 2, 3, and you only had to have three nodes instead of six. Whatever weight parameter you want to use it as, you have to have something there. And then, as your depth first searches, it starts by searching normally, just trying to find the answer. And then once it finds the answer, it has some kind of distance or some kind of target metric now. So for the example I said before, where your system, or um, for the example I said before, if your path goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6, that gives you a total path length of 14. As it keeps searching and it keeps track of its current path, if it ever gets to the point where its distance is greater than 14, we can stop exploring that route and continue backtracking and exploring a different route. So let's show this as an example. So our starting node is going to be 1, and our target node is going to be 6. We want to try to find the fastest way 
to get from one to six. Say we're a truck driver and time is money, of course, and you're trying to get from A to six as fast as possible so you can go deliver some other package. Starting with node one, you have to figure out some way to decide to start searching the algorithm. And since we're trying to find shortest distance, it's probably a good idea to just choose the node that has the least cost. In this case, you would go from one to two, because it only cost one. Then from two, you have to go to three, which costs six. Then from three, we have the option to go to five, go to six, or go to four. Two is the next smallest cost, so we would then go to two, or four. Four is the next smallest cost, it costs two, so we would then go to four. Next, we would look at this, and we would go to 5 over 6, because 5 only costs 1 distance instead of 10. So we then go to 5, and then at last, we go to 6. And as we saw before, this gave up a total of 14. For 1, 6 is 7, 8, 9, 10, and 4 is 14. Now what it does is it keeps track of this path and saves it, the algorithm will then store this path as the current shortest path that it's found. It'll then go ahead and backtrack its path. So its current path is 1, 2, 3, 4, and we now backtrack 1 to 5. Well, from 5, there's nowhere else to explore. So then we backtrack again to 4. From four, we could then explore going straight to six. However, if we do that, our path would be one, seven, eight, nine, and you add 10, that would be 19. That would be greater than this 14. There's no point in exploring that path. So we don't even care about that path. We then backtrack again. And this time we would backtrack to three. We now have two other options to go for. Because of 4, we went from 3 straight to 4. Now, if we go straight to 9, this will give us 1, 6, which is 7, plus 9 gives us 16. That's still greater than this 14, so there's no point in exploring that. If we take this second route here to 5, this gives us 1, 6, which is 7, plus 7 is 14. So theoretically, we can explore this route, even though it's equal to, in case for some reason this next path costs zero. However, it doesn't, it costs four, which would give us a larger um, distance than we already have. And we backtrack to two. From two, we have nowhere else to explore, so we then backtrack again and go to one. We only have one more option to explore to, and this time we go to directly to three instead of going through two. We then go from one to three, which cause two. From here, we already know what the shortest path because we've already explored it several times from three. It's from three to four to five to six. Because we've already explored all the other options here. This now gives us two 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. This gives us our true shortest path. All right, we are halfway through, and if you have made it this far and like the video, please subscribe and hit the bell for more. Leave a like if you have learned something new, and comment down below what you would like to learn next. So another search algorithm is the breadth first search. And the biggest difference is in depth first search, you go very deep and tunnel down one path. In breadth first search, you go very wide and explore all the paths kind of at the same time. So the best way to explain it is to just show an example. So we're going to start at node A. And our goal is to get to node, we'll say, J. In order to keep track of things for breadth first search, you need to use what's called a queue. If you don't know what a queue is, it's exactly what it sounds like it is. It's like a line of people waiting for an amusement park ride. The first people to go in 
are the first people to go out into the ride. The last people to go into the queue are the last people to be served to go out and go to the uh, ride. Um, if it's a grocery store and you've got several people in line to get served to get their groceries checked out and leave, the first people get service first, the last people get service last. First in, first out, last in, last out. In this case, we're going to be putting in notes. So, our starting note is A, so we will first load A into our queue. Now, the way that this breadth first search works is you look at whatever the first note is of the queue, you load up all of the adjacent notes to it into the queue, and then you cross it off. You then go to the next node in the queue, which you may have just loaded, look at it, add all of the adjacent nodes up into the queue, and then continue on. Starting off with A, the adjacent nodes to A are B, C, and D. And you can load these up however you want to. But we now need to put B, C, and D in the queue. We're now done exploring A. We don't need any more. We now need to look at B. So going down to B, the only adjacent node is E. So we then have to load an E. Now, depth first search would have continued looking down for E, but in breadth first search, we continue with the nodes adjacent to A. So we're going wide and exploring all these adjacent nodes first, and then exploring the adjacent nodes to them, and exploring the adjacent nodes next to those, and so on and so forth. So going now, we're done with B. Looking at C, the adjacent node is E. E is already loaded, so we don't need to reload E into the queue. So now we're done with C, we go to D. The adjacent node to D is F. So we load F to the queue, and we're now done with D. E is next, which the adjacent node is G. Still have not hit our desired uh, node yet, so we cross out E. We then go to F. Adjacent nodes are G and I. We don't need to load G back up, so we only load I. Crossing out F. Next is our G. We then have to load H because that's the adjacent node to H, or that's the adjacent node to G. Uh, we can then cross out G. Next, we look at I, and we see J and K. We then load J and K. We then go ahead and cross out I. We don't need any more. So then looking at H, H has no adjacent nodes. Then looking at K, well, or J. Well, J is our desired node. So we have found our information or whatever we're looking for. So we're done. Now for a real world example, and an example of why sometimes breadth first search can be a lot faster than depth first search, it depends on your situation. Let's say we're Facebook. And someone searches for one of their friend's friend. And let's say this is them. And in this case, they've got four friends. Well, this is friend one. This is friend two. This is friend three, and this is friend four. Each one of these friends has a bunch of other friends. And let's say the, the desired person they're searching for is this person right here. Go ahead and label this person the goal person. Depth first search could get lucky and could start here, search here, and then search here and find it real fast. The problem is, depth first search could also go from here to this person to this person. And you know Facebook is one gigantic network of people. 
and it could be searching again and again and again and and it could it could search through hundreds of thousands even millions of people and not find anyone and then have to backtrack and it's just a giant mess it's awful it's it's horrible breadth for search for this case would work out a lot better for breadth for search it would search this person's friends to see if that's the desired location wouldn't find them in any of those and then would search all the friends of their friends however this time you would find it eventually much faster than death first search so it's very important when deciding whether to use depth first search and breadth first search which you actually use for what problem or what system it is sometimes it doesn't really matter Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe and hit the bell for more videos. Leave a like if you have learned something new and comment down below what you would like to learn next.